The Tom Woods Show, episode 457. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. If you want to learn a new language without just having words barked at you, then I recommend Rocket Languages, where you really learn how the language works. Get a free mini course through tomwoods.com slash rocket. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. What an episode we have for you today talking about child protective services. And I think to the extent most people give any thought to child protective services at all, they think this is a benign institution. After all, it's looking after the welfare of children. What could be better than that? Well, that characterization is very much disputed by our guest today, Carlos Morales. Carlos Morales is a former Child Protective Services investigator. He is president and founder of Child Protective Services Victim Support and a committed legal advocate for family reunification. We're going to be talking about his book, Legally Kidnapped, The Case Against Child Protective Services. Remember, by the way, to get your copy of my free ebook, 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered by texting the word LIBERTY to 33444. We talk about defense and law and sweatshops and drugs and banking and the environment and all kinds of issues you're going to have to deal with when arguing with your friends. We help you sort that all out and give you some good arguments for your arsenal. So that's texting the word LIBERTY to 33444 to get that free ebook. All right, let's turn now to Carlos Morales. Carlos, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. This is such a shocking book and story that you have here, and it's on a topic that I think a lot of libertarians are uneasy about, because as you note in the book, there obviously are cases in which children's welfare uh, is obviously not being maximized in particular homes, and people then draw from that the conclusion that the system we have now is obviously protecting them. The same way I think they draw this conclusion from the police. They say the police, you know, they see the police helping a guy with a flat tire or coming over to somebody's house after he's been burglarized, never actually returning the items, of course. And they conclude that, well, the system, you know, the system works. And that anything to the contrary is probably just some outlier that, you know, you're going to have these cases. You get a bad apple, or you just get a weird situation. But by and large, the thing works. Is that false when it comes to child protective services? Well, seeing as how I b- wrote a book called "Legally Kidnapped," you can assume <laughs> yeah, my that was the biggest that, softball ever to, to, to that question. Um, you know, when it comes to child protective services and the topic of abuse as a whole, the reason why I started working for child protective services originally was because I was convinced that that was the only way to be able to try and stop child abuse as a whole. Where I'm coming from is not a parent's rights issue. Me, it's a kid's rights issue. And Child Protective Services has done the exact opposite of what their intention supposedly was for, which was to protect children. Now, when we're talking about things like physical and sexual abuse, that is prevalent in the in every single culture across the world. It's something that's still occurring, and it's incredibly tragic. But when you take a look at the statistics, even by CPS's own numbers, with the fact that 80% of removals of children are not for physical or sexual abuse, but they're for negligence. And the way that the government chooses to define negligence is about as obscure as how they decide to define the term freedom. It's a pretty negligible term in and of itself in that it can be used to justify the removal of a child for things as simple as allowing the child to play outside or false allegations completely or a parent admitting that when they were in college, They smoked a little uh, doobie at one point, and therefore, they're not a good parent anymore. And if you take also a look at the numbers, the amount of children who are in child protective services care right now, which is over 400,000, it is amazing to me that, one, I'm the first ever child protective services whistleblower who came out and actually said anything more than just, we need more pay or we need more workers, uh, but also that this isn't being talked about more often. I think in part... The reason why it's not spoken of uh, about a lot is, one, people are afraid, which is fair, because Child Protective Services has went after activists in the past. And two, it has to do with the kind of people that CPS goes after, which is generally um, people who are kind of impoverished. They go after immigrants. They go after minorities. They go after people who cannot defend themselves and don't know the laws in the get-go 
or people who have had the government involved in their life for such a large period of time that they just assume that they don't have any rights and that a CPS investigator can just go into their house, ask their kid whatever questions they want, and the parents aren't allowed to know anything. And so what I'm trying to do is simply educate people not to protect child abusers, but to protect protect uh, good parents from the abuse of the state. I bet another reason, by the way, is even when you have an affluent family that gets in trouble with with CPS, is that since everybody gives this institution the benefit of the doubt, if you come out and say, we're being harassed by these people, the presumption is going to be, you probably had it coming to you. What are you up to in your household? So everybody has got to keep quiet because, frankly, it's embarrassing to be in trouble with these people. There's more victim blaming going on whenever it comes to CPS um uh, parents dealing with CPS than I've seen even when it comes to cops dealing with black people. I mean, it is amazing to me how often this whole idea is brought up that, well, CPS is doing something right or simply the case that it's a few bad apples as we already brought up earlier. And we'll get into this a little bit here, but the financial incentives presented to Child Protective Services to remove children, uh, that to me is really the tr tree of all the evil here. It's where the money is coming from and it's the incentives of Child Protective Services to remove kids and destroy households on a constant basis. Not because these people are malice or evil from the bone, although I met some investigators that I don't think I could ever call them good people. Uh, but simply put, the government, the whole way that it's set up, leads to this type of situation because it is a monopolistic force that steals money. At the very beginning of your book, you tell a story that you describe as the most open and shut case you can imagine of an abusive household. Yes. And you say, this really solidified me as somebody you know, happy and proud to be in CPS. But then obviously something over time began to wear on you. Was there a particular moment or was it an accumulation of moments that made you finally say, that's it, that's the straw that broke the camel's back, I can't be part of this anymore? So, yeah, my first case was interesting. Uh, I, I go into pretty graphic detail uh, in that chapter kind of discussing uh, how awful it was. I mean, I went to this house. There was a drug raid that had just occurred. There was children's fecal matter everywhere. I mean, it was absolutely atrocious. I looked at that situation and thought, hey, look, we're heroes. We're getting these kids out of the situation. So that was my first case, and I thought, yes, I'm a good guy. From there, though, I never got an open and shut case like that again. It was time after time going to parents because someone once said this one thing about someone smoking marijuana. It was drug case after drug case, not crystal meth here. We're talking about weed. We're not talking about alcoholism. We're talking about marijuana. Marijuana was such a, such a huge aspect of this. We were a branch of the Drug Enforcement Agency. And at the time when I was working for CPS, a big problem, bone ethics, was that I had read Murray Rothbard before I had even started working for CPS. All right, that was another question I was going to ask. All right, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was, I was already into this. I got into Stefan Molyneux back in 2006. I mean, this was when I just started out in college. But what I was seeing constantly, though, was harassing parents and my supervisors telling me that I needed more removals because it was obvious that I wasn't doing my job correctly. If you took a look at the numbers of removals I had, which was under 10 over the course of a year, versus some of the other investigators who are having 30 or 40 in a month, you would look at both of us and go, I'm the incompetent worker. In actuality, I actually did my investigation practices of asking legitimate questions to kids and parents to be able to decipher whether or not it would be better off if the child was removed from the household. So a mixture of, mar of false marijuana charges, a mixture of just false allegations as a whole, and good reporting practices by me, which was antithetical to the reporting practices of CPS as a whole, yeah, it was pretty bad. And, you know, I should have known. I should have known from the get-go. I should have known whenever they said, oh, you're a sociology major? Okay, you seem about fit for the job. Here's maybe two months of training. We're going to teach you almost nothing about how to question people. We're going to teach you fraudulent practices about how to ask leading questions. We're going to tell you that you're going to be so smart when you leave here, you're going to know every single time that someone is lying to you. You're also going to have the capability to be able to psychologize individuals and to be able to handle massive dispute resolutions and, and, uh, and dispute situations whereby you'll be able to conquer uh, these, these abusive families. And we're also constantly told that it was the world is worse now for kids than ever, that parents are more abusive now than ever, and that the world is scarier now than ever. And of course, all of those things are actually untrue. But 
the entire platform, the entire training protocol, the entire way that CPS was run was incompetence to the fullest. When people, for instance, you know, how are we going to replace child protective services when we have no more state? I asked them, how are we going to replace the DEA? Well, we're not going to because I don't want an organization like this to exist with, without the state. And actually, it can't exist without the state. Well, I want to come back to that at the very end because it's a natural wrap-up sort of question. Yeah. But in in a case like this where you're you're investigating problems facing children in particular households, you come up with the, the naughty problem of children's testimony because, of course, we know that children's testimony can be extremely unreliable, but at the same time, at some level, you feel like you can't discount it altogether. How did they teach you how to navigate that thicket? So uh, the best case example, and I bring this up in my chapter, Satan and the Issue with Evidence, was the satanic ritualistic abuses that supposedly occurred in the 1980s and 90s in America. There was a thousand satanic ritualistic abuses uh, alleged across the country. And in these particular cases, they were saying that uh, daycare workers were flying around buildings, sacrificing children, throwing them in toilets, and that Chuck Norris emerged from hell and chopped one of the kids in half. That was, a, that was actual in case reports by Child Protective Services saying that this actually happened. Now, what was occurring in these particular situations, what was called leading questions. So here's an example. I'm at a daycare. I'm talking to a kid. You know, little Tommy told me that Rebecca was sticking her finger somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Now, little Tommy's a really good kid, and I like him, and I think it's awesome that he told me that. So why don't you tell me more about that? Well, see, that's an abuse of power, right? Because a kid is in a situation where he just either wants you to go away, right? Or he wants you, he wants to be, you to be appeased. He wants you to be happy with whatever happens here. So when it came to Child Protective Services, what would happen with us, and that leading question problem still hasn't quite went away yet, I'm a CPS investigator. I'm told that the state owns the child, that the parent does not own the child, that I can go to a public school, ask a kid a bunch of different questions who's five years old, ask him if he wants to be recorded, which means a five-year-old is then therefore capable of consent, ask him leading questions like, how often does your father hit you? How often are you touched by your nanny? Right? I ask them these leading questions, and they just give me whatever I want. Now, I recorded that conversation, and what gets even worse with the issue of evidence is this. We're told not to write down exactly what they stated. We were told to write a narrative, which means we're supposed to create a story about what happened. So you have this kid who's being asked leading questions who might have overheard someone else say something else at one point regarding something regarding abuse. So you basically have this long telephone game, and we call that evidence. We call that justice, and from there – we can enact the total power of the state to destroy this family. You mentioned at one point that money and following the money is very important, and I do want to get to that. But I would bet that the average person in Child Protective Services probably thinks he's doing the right thing. In, in his own twisted way, probably thinks he's doing the right thing, probably does not think he's being influenced by financial considerations or uh, influences like that. So well, yeah, what are your comments on that? It, it, it depends, right? Like we've had, I mean, I knew investigators who simply just stated, well, this is a really secure job that helps me out. Like I knew ones who I don't think they even thought they were doing anything good. They just thought, oh, well, this is just something to do and it's a job. I mean, a lot of bureaucratic workers are like that. I'm not going to say that every single one of these people was like, I'm an angel trying to fight against child abuse. Now, when it comes to the, the, the intentions of these workers, yeah, some of them are good. But here, here's the truth of the matter. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And CPS proved that time and time again. I don't, I don't, intentions don't matter that much to me when you stick a kid in the foster home for doing absolutely nothing and for his parents doing absolutely nothing. And when you look at foster home statistics where a child is seven to eight times more likely to be physically or sexually abused, where 50% will end up homeless whenever they age out, where they are three times more likely to be put on psychotropic drugs where they're more likely to get post-traumatic stress disorder than veterans of war and less likely to recover from it, and they are six times more likely to die than if they stayed in an impoverished household. When you look at that, and guess what? Those, those studies, those aren't hard to find. You look up foster homes on Wikipedia and you can find them. When you look at that and you say, well, I still have good intentions. Well, once, you, once the education is out there, um, you don't get a break anymore. If you know what's going on in the camps and you still keep saying, well, this is what you're supposed to do, even though you can volitionally choose to quit, I can't exactly consider you an ethical person. 
what happens, let's say I get in trouble with Child Protective Services for some reason. Let's say my neighbor just reports something, and it's and maybe it's without foundation, and maybe I get cleared. Uh, maybe there's 10% truth to it, but it's being distorted, whatever. I mean, just say for some reason they come to my house, and let's say they find there's there's adequate reason to proceed with a case against me. What happens next? What can I expect to have happen? Uh, innocence until proven guilty? Um, no, guilty until proven innocent. So I'm an investigator. I am this. I have a hero complex. I just got this report that they're supposedly say at Tom's house there's uh, cocaine and and strippers and child abuse and all this other stuff. So when I'm reading that case report, I'm looking at something where I go, "Hey, look at how terrible this human being is." So the moment I step into your house, I already have this idea of the person that you are, and as a result. I'm going to be as coercive as I can be to be able to get the answers that I want because in my mind, you're a child abuser. I've talked to investigators who so many of them would say, I know they're an abuser. I just don't have the evidence yet. So that is guilty until proven innocent. And when it comes to what to do if Child Protective Services comes after you, of course, to know the information regarding CPS, which is why I'm choosing to present this in this kind of way. It sounds slightly shocking maybe in the way that I decided to put it, but I'm just trying to be honest. And to let people within your own community know who Child Protective Services is as well. Your friends, your, your family, uh, your colleagues. So as to if they see something abusive occurring, maybe they won't immediately call CPS or maybe they'll just you know actually talk to the parent or see if they can help out the situation. Then from there, if an investigator does come to your home, well, you treat them kind of like you treat a cop. But guess what? They have even less power in their particular cases. So you don't let the investigator into your home. You record the entire conversation. If you have a lawyer on tap, you go ahead and you call up your lawyer so that they can talk with the investigator with you. You don't let a private interview with your kid. So if your kid's in public school state, which i rather them not be in public school, but hey, it's not my call. You let your kid know, don't talk to CPS investigators if they ever come to talk to you. So if you're already preparing yourself, you're 80% of the way there. Now, if you decide to talk to the CPS investigator, you got to make sure, of course, not to contradict anything you're stating because that's what they're looking for is contradictions in your story because they already assume you're a liar, as well as don't admit to any prior wrongdoings. Am I stating to lie? No, not exactly. But if you, uh, if you did say smoke marijuana three years ago, I don't think they need to particularly know that information. And most importantly, something that they're not going to tell you is that you have a right to know what's going on in your case. So we were told, don't tell the parent exactly what the case is about. You can't let them on because then they'll know their rights. So you got to actually make sure you only answer questions that are related to those. So most important things, don't admit, don't contradict, and record. And if you do those simple steps, you'll get pretty, pretty good in there. And I've been, uh, for the last, say, year, I've been running Child Protective Services Victim Support, which is a, it's a Facebook page, you know, a couple thousand people or whatever. But even in that small community, I've seen a huge change just over the last year of people sending me messages saying, hey, CPS came to my house and they were in and out in about five minutes and the case was closed because they did exactly what I stated. So it, it's a lot of this is about entrapment. And a lot of this is about protecting yourself. Now, if the case does end up going uh, past that investigation process and you're in a situation where you're going to have to be questioned again, or maybe your kids are removed, the number one thing I tell people is get yourself a good family court attorney because going into a court uh, without an attorney is basically showing up to a gunfight with a spork. They know the rules. They know the game. So you're going to be, you're going to lose in this particular situation, especially with these terrible judges that are out there for family court. So it's, it's just about protecting yourself as much as you can. Tell us about on the, along the same lines, court appointed special advocates. That sounds oh, warm and fuzzy. What is it? Oh, CASA, CASA, CASA. Okay. So you'll actually see these people trying to fundraise money and things like that. So CASA is a group of individuals, which are supposedly child advocates. We're talking about, you know, 45-year-old middle-class moms who have nothing else to do, so they say, I'm going to be a child advocate. I'm going to help out kids. They're supposedly the voice of the child in a court case instead of having an actual lawyer for the child. They're supposed to uh, – they go to houses and things like that, and they say these are the things this child needs. This is the abuse that is supposedly occurring in this household. Now, most of them have very little training. A lot of them 
have this hero complex, which is one of the biggest problems I see with the state as a whole is everyone's trying to be a hero. So they think that there's they are angels for truth. If you take a look at, uh, I, I bring up um, this in my book. I believe the, the title is um, Family Court's Sacred Cow, CASA. Even according to their own statistics, whenever a CASA representative ends up with a kid, you end up with longer court cases, worse situations for the kids, and way worse situations if the child happens to be a minority. I'm not screaming uh, out to the walls, you know, that there's racism abundant within all of America, but I will state that there may be a little bit of racism whenever it comes to the justice system and court cases as a whole, which is why black people only make up about 10 to 12 percent of the country, but they make up about 40 percent of all uh, foster kids. And when they're in those foster homes, they're less likely to be adopted and they're less likely to be moved quickly. Um, so I, I would say CASA is just another massive failure. And it's really unfortunate that I see people who are talking about child protective services badly and then going, isn't CASA great? Um, it's every single branch of the family court system is pretty uh, terrible. Carlos, let's pause for just a moment for this message. Hey, everybody, if you want to learn a new language, I strongly recommend Rocket Languages. I told you guys a story in a recent episode of trying to learn French in graduate school, and they had adopted this fashionable new method of just barking French words at you, thinking that you'll learn a language when you're 20 or 25 the same way you learn it when you're two years old. Well, obviously, that's not true. You have to understand the structure of the language. I was begging them to teach me the structure of the language and not just bark words at me. Well, they refused, so I learned no French whatsoever, and it was a total waste of my time. But I finally found Rocket Languages, which teaches languages the way I would if I were structuring a language program. I learn the words, I learn vocabulary, but I also learn the structure of the language, and I get lessons I can listen to on the go in my car. Check out a free mini course through tomwoods.com slash rocket. Now, Carlos, you have performed the very important service of writing this book, Legally Kidnapped, so I almost feel bad putting it quite this way because I think what you've done is heroic. But maybe would you be willing to share with us something specific that you did when you were with CPS that when you look back on it, you're not really proud of? Oh, okay. Um... Yeah. Because you know, yeah, you're yeah, a whistleblower, no. you were part of yeah, the machine, yeah. um, right? And you, you had good intentions. Absolutely. Uh, there was a, a one particular case in which um, I went out to a home to assess whether or not there was uh, child abuse occurring. And I stuck I, – uh, the stepfather in this particular situation, it was being suggested that he was using marijuana. So I went ahead and I spoke to them. And he stated, yes, I, uh, I, I smoke weed. And I, I kind of gave him that blank stare, like, why are you telling me this? Why are you giving me this information? Because at the time, even, I was like, I, this isn't really all of that important. Um, but he was being recorded at the time. Um, I was recording the conversation that I was having with him. And as a result, I had to remove the children out of the situation. That caused a lot of stress between the stepmother and the, and the mother. Um, they ended up uh, almost getting divorced in this particular case, but sadly, the, the saddest aspect of this entire thing was that the children were removed and stuck in a foster care situation, and as soon as they got there, uh, they were stuck on psychotropic drugs that drained, and, uh, their dra- drained their brain, to be quite honest. It really hurt them. I traumatized um, this family, and I traumatized those kids. And when you look at the financial incentives for the psychotropic drugging of children in these particular situations, it gets really, really barbaric because psychotropic drugs are 21st century child abuse as far as I'm concerned. Carlos, I think in 457 episodes, that's the toughest question I've ever asked anybody. But I think it makes you real. I mean, it shows that you're, you're a real person and you're, you're a man and you – you know, you really have faced the music about this, and that's why I really do want people to read what you've written because you can be trusted. You're a real human being. Even when I've started off, you know, a lot of my speeches, I, I go on and I basically just state from the get-go, like, I'm guilty of doing these things. I'm guilty of working for Child Protective Services, and the work that I'm doing now 
It's not like it's exactly paying me hundreds of thousands of dollars or guarding me mass, massive amounts of fame. In a way, it's to kind of atone for my sins, and it's a way to atone for the, the actions that I committed while I was working for CPS as a whole, and I'm doing my best that I can to help as many families as, as I can. Let's wrap up by saying a little bit about the last section of your book, which is in and of itself worth the price of the book, which is how to protect yourself and what exactly to do if you find yourself ensnared by CPS. And you go through, here's what you should do in court, here's what you should do if they're coming to your house. I mean, it's You've got sections on all this stuff. People are going to have to read that for themselves, but just a couple of quick tips that you would that you think people need to know that maybe they don't know. Well, so I went ahead and I brought up some of those a little bit earlier here, of course, is is the ideas of don't allow for private interviews with 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 your kids. I mean, that that is to me the number one right there. Because even if these people have the best of intentions, they're gonna ask a lot of leading questions. They're gonna lead to some disturbing uh, situations. So I, I'll bring up an example of this, a perfect example. It's a guy in North Carolina that I met. He had already had spent $200,000 on court fees, right, to be able to get his kid back. What had occurred was they said that he had been sexually molesting his daughter, which is a horrific situation, absolutely. So I talked to him, and I asked him, hey, did you get a recording of the investigator um, with the child? He's like, well, why would I do that? I was like, your attorney hasn't asked for that? He's like, no. Okay, go ahead and get that recording. Then about a week, the case was closed. Why? Because the investigator asked three times, how often does your dad touch you? And then finally asked, does your dad ever touch your private parts whenever he is washing you in the tub? Right? Like just cleaning you. Is it when, when he's cleaning you? Because the kid was like two and a half, three years old. And based off of that, that guy lost $200,000. Based off of that, that kid was traumatized. So the most important thing is here is just don't allow private interviews with, with the kids ever. And to record all interactions. And if you end up in family court, always have an attorney with you. That book, the second section, to me, was the, the most important part of the book. I mean, I go through very intense detail of exactly what to do in court, how to dress, how to talk, to understand the judges, to understand that the judges are paid for by the state, and so is the defense, and so is, the, so is your defense attorney if you're choosing to go with the state one. Just look at all the incentives. Look at all the incentives to destroy you. This is how you prepare yourself. And that's why I was so very rigorous and I actually got help from a uh, local Free State Project representative uh, attorney out here to help write that section too. Because you know what? I'm not an attorney, so I need to make sure that I look to specialists as well. Now, let me f finish up with the question that basically anybody's going to want to ask you. All right, granted that the current system is a nightmare that nobody would possibly want to have to navigate on, on the other hand, there are obviously, as you concede, cases in which children's welfare is not served by leaving them in the home. Is there any way that we can look after the welfare of those children without creating the kinds of abuses that we see in the current system? So it, it is by far and away the most difficult question that I'm generally asked, yeah. and the one that I'm asked uh, obviously the most often. I have found that um, Community building can be really helpful, knowing your neighbor, knowing the people around you. If you go to church, knowing the people who are interacting within your own church. A big problem that occurs here whenever the state gets involved is that it monopolizes any particular service, and then everyone assumes afterwards that we couldn't have ever lived without that monopoly. So, you know, parents would actually go and talk to other parents. Community leaders would go talk to other parents and see how they can help out in situations. Is it an economic issue? Is there a money issue? Is there something that you could do to try and better help out the situation? I am not a central planner, so I obviously cannot give an answer for every single particular case. It is very rare that CPS getting involved will help out a particular situation. If there is massive violence, you know, you see a kid outside caged up being beaten with a belt, obviously you can call CPS, but although I would just call the police in that particular case when a situation is that absolutely dire. But the vast majority of child abuse out there is not like that. And if we can open up a community and open up a dialogue whenever it comes to these and not yell at people forever saying maybe you shouldn't do these particular actions, um, I think we can get a lot further in this world by doing that and trying to stomp out child abuse as a whole. Personally, for me, I work with the Free State Project in New Hampshire, which is a very strong community of 1,500 libertarian folks. And as a result, there's open dialogue regarding things like parenting. Uh, regarding helping out people in situations in which they need help, maybe with their kids or daycare or anything else. And by opening up that market, 
by implementing those changes in your own life, those things that are within your own control, you can live a happier life and a lot of other people can end up living a happier life. Well, the book is Legally Kidnapped, The Case Against Child Protective Services. You can check it out at legallykidnapped.net. We'll also be linking to it on today's show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 457. Carlos, thanks so much for your time today. I hope a lot of people will check out your book, and best of luck with this important work that you're doing. Thank you, and thank you for all the work that you're doing as well. All right, everybody, before I tell you what we're going to do tomorrow— couple quick items for you. The first, of course, as you already know, I have another free ebook available at freewebsitebook.com because it's a book about how to start that blog or website, even if you know nothing about programming or design. Where do you get started? Check out that free ebook at freewebsitebook.com. If you want to start up that blog, I've got a video showing you how to go from no blog at all to a blog in just five minutes. And you can watch that video over at tomwoods.com slash demo. Secondly, those of you listening on Stitcher may have noticed a lag. For several days, you weren't getting any episodes at all, whereas people listening on iTunes or Podcast Republic and a lot of other podcatchers were getting the episodes. Well, there was an issue with FeedBurner. I don't know if you guys follow any of this stuff, but I guess I had too many episodes or there's some kind of thing where we had to work on it. I had to hire somebody to come in and unclog it. It was just horrifying, but we are back to normal as far as I can see. But thanks to you good folks for making your Amazon purchases through my Amazon widget at TomWoods.com and on all the show notes pages like TomWoods.com slash 457 today's. You'll see there's an Amazon widget. And by making your purchases through that at no cost to yourself, you help to support the show and you help me to pay unexpected bills like the one I just incurred. The easiest way to get to Amazon that will credit the show is just through TomWoods.com slash Amazon. I just set up that redirect the other day, TomWoods.com slash Amazon. Bookmark that baby and help me out when you make your Amazon purchases. I certainly appreciate it. All right, tomorrow, Walter Block comes back to the show, and we're going to examine the question, is it morally legitimate and philosophically consistent for libertarians to accept government money? Now, that can take all kinds of forms. It could be going on welfare. It could be working for the government. It could be being a professor at a government university or at a university that gets some form of government assistance. Whatever it is, can a libertarian do that? We're going to ask Mr. Libertarian himself, Walter Block, to help us understand the answer to that question, to help us understand the whole debate. So that's tomorrow. You'd be crazy not to tune in for that. Think you'll be rebuking yourself the rest of your life. I missed the episode with Block. Don't do that to yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Remember about the show tomorrow. Thanks so much for listening. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.